Author and Professor Sam Keen was going through a pretty rough time in his life. His marriage had ended, he missed his children. A relationship with another woman had started well, but was slipping through his fingers. And so he went to see his friend Howard Thurman at Boston University. They sat and talked and sipped bourbon all afternoon while Keene poured out the miseries of his life. And finally, as the day was winding down and Keene was preparing to leave, Thurman gave him this bit of advice. He said, Sam, there are two questions a person must ask himself or herself in life. The first question is, where am I going? And the second question is, who will go with me? And if you ever get those two questions in the wrong order, you're in big trouble. I've thought about Howard Thurman's advice to Sam Keen. Through the ups and downs of my own relationships and the relationships around me, I've come again and again to agree with the wisdom of those words. The first question is, where am I going? And the second question is, who will go with me? But I think it's not only important to ask who will go with me, but also to ask what will go with me. Once I decide where my life is going, I need to struggle with the question of what I'll take along. And on this Consecration Sunday, on this day when we consider our commitments for the coming year, we cannot avoid, avoid asking, where am I going and what will go with me? And God help us if we ever get them in the wrong order. Where am I going? It's a question that reaches to the heart of my life's purpose. What are my ultimate loyalties? What am I willing to give my life to? When all is said and done, what is so basic to the fabric of my life that for me life would cease to have any meaning if I gave it up? Some 2,000 years ago, lots of people across the Judean countryside thought they wanted to follow Jesus. They thought that's where they wanted to go in their lives. But then one day Jesus began to talk about things that disturbed them, stuff like eating his flesh and drinking his blood, about suffering and dying, about taking up a cross. And John's Gospel says a lot of those folks said, eh, you know what? Yeah, we're having second thoughts. Jesus, you're really not what we were looking for after all. And they headed off in a different direction. Jesus watched them go. And then he turned to the 12 disciples who were standing there kind of in a knot, trying desperately not to look at Jesus. And he asked them, do you also wish to go away? Do you also want your life to go in another direction? And the twelve pawed the dust with their sandals and whistled nervously until finally Peter said, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. It was Peter's answer to the question of where are you going? The answer was, we're staying with you. Wherever you go, Jesus, that's where we go. We're, we're coming with you. That's where we're going. Peter had wrestled with the question of where he was going before getting bogged down in the question of what he could take with him. No, he didn't have everything figured out. He didn't have all the answers he wanted, but at least he knew where he was going. At least he knew the direction of his life. He's kind of like Daniel Boone, who was once asked if he'd ever gotten lost. And Boone replied, lost? No, I was never lost, but I was bewildered once for three days. Peter might have been bewildered from time to time, but he knew where his life was going, and he settled that issue before asking what he wanted to take with him. Now, the Pharisees, in today's reading from Matthew, on the other hand, had asked the questions in the wrong order. They were more concerned with what they would take with them than they were with the direction their lives were going. Oh, they acted like they knew where they were going. They pontificated on obeying God, but Jesus exposed their hypocrisy. 
In this passage, we usually focus on that famous line, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. But the most important line in the text, I think, is where Jesus says to the Pharisees, show me the coin used for the tax. Jerry, if you could advance to the next slide. Thank you. You see, most Roman coins, like the denarius, that's the one you see on the left, had an image of the emperor on it, surrounded by the words Caesar, King, and Son of God. Sound familiar? But you see, pious Jews found a coin like that blasphemous because of the, prohibi the prohibition in the Ten Commandments against graven images. And since Judea was such an incendiary region that the Romans had problems with all the time, they decided discretion was the better part of valor. And so they minted another more nondescript coin for Jews to use when paying the temple tax. That's the coin you see on the left. It was this tax that the Pharisees were using to try and trap Jesus into a statement either blasphemous or treasonous. But Jesus said... Show me the coin used for the tax. And guess which coin these pious, righteous, we're not going to compromise our principles, Pharisees were carrying around with them. Not the coin on the left, the coin on the right, the one with Caesar's image and inscription on it. These Pharisees may have been confused about where they were going, but they'd already decided what they were going to take with them, and it was going to be legal tender, by golly. Okay, you can go to the next slide, Jerry. So it reminds me of the man who was the sole survivor of a mid-air collision between two planes over Brazil back in 1960. Somehow or another, this man survived a fall of more than 10,000 feet and suffered only minor injuries. A reporter from a Brazilian newspaper asked him what he remembered about the experience, and he said, the only thing I remember from the fall was that just before I hit, I felt in my back pocket to see if my wallet was still there. He didn't know whether he would live or die or be incapacitated, but he sure knew what he was taking with him. Where am I going? What am I taking with me? Those are the two questions that must be asked in the right order. I was in a seminary class, and the professor wanted us to learn about cooperating in groups. And so he divided us all into clusters of about five or six students. And he said, I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation. He said, I want you to imagine that your group has been taking a trip together in a small airplane. Over northern Minnesota, the plane's engine conks out, and you crash in a very remote wooded area. Unfortunately, the pilot and the co-pilot are dead. However, none of the rest of you are seriously injured. Now, you don't really know where you are. And this being Minnesota in the dead of winter, the temperature is umpteen degrees below zero. But you are not without resources. And then the professor ticked off for us a mishmash of stuff in the wreckage of the planes, things like a newspaper, a topographical map, a handgun, a, some steel wool, a cigarette lighter with no, no lighter fluid in it. And then he said, your assignment is to figure out how you're going to survive and then rank those items from the plane in order of importance. So we got to work. Everybody in my group came up with some pretty good, pretty creative ideas for how to use those items on our trek back to civilization. Ideas like using the topographical map to figure out where the nearest town might be and then plot out the route to the closest town. Using the handgun to kill small game on the way, using the flint from the cigarette lighter to spark a fire, using the newspaper to start a fire. We all thought we were being really resourceful. Finally, the professor asked each group to share their ideas, and every other group had some good ideas too. And we were all right proud of ourselves for deciding what we would do with the stuff that we would be taking with us. And then the professor smiled benignly and said, Folks, the reason why pilots file flight plans with the airport before they take off 
is so that in case of a crash, they will have some place to look for you. So the first order of business is to decide to stay with the wreckage until you're found and use all of those items from the plane to survive right where you are. If you go charging off in a remote area in the dead of winter where nobody knows where you are, well, let me put it this way. You're all dead. We had decided what to take with us before deciding where we would go. And we were all dead. Is that the reason for the deadness in our culture, in our current society? Is that the reason our politics are dead is because we've decided what to take with us before we decide where we're going? Is our civility dead because we reverse the order of the questions? Are our institutions dead for the same reason? Is our sense of security dead for the same reason? Like I said last week, it all comes down to Jesus. Are we like Peter, staying with him, following him, listening to him, if so, we don't really have to worry about what to take with us. Maybe we should become like the Sherpas who were carrying equipment for a British mountain climbing expedition in Nepal. And they were climbing at a pretty good pace until they stopped and refused to go any further. The British demanded the interpreter to command them to go on, but the interpreter said, no, no, they're afraid to go on. They say they've been moving so fast, they must wait for their souls to catch up with them. I wonder how many of us have that empty feeling, that aching in our hearts, that sense that something is askew in our lives because we've traveled so quickly, worked so hard, grabbed for all we can, and left our souls behind. Because we've asked the questions in the wrong order and jettisoned what really matters in our wake. Marilyn Kaufman gave me permission to tell you about a conversation I had with her late husband, John. And oh, how the ache for him still stays with me. John once told me, Paris, when I started out my career, I sat down and figured up how much money I was going to need to provide for my family and live comfortably. Somewhere along the line, I realized I was making about 10 times that amount. Now my greatest joy is finding ways to give it away. John may have started out asking the questions in the wrong order, but he waited for his soul to catch up. And he left us an incredible legacy of generosity. So as we come forward in a few minutes to make our commitments for 2018, I'm challenging myself to get the questions in the right order. True, my tenure here as your senior pastor is winding down, but I'm not done yet. And Penny and I are still making a financial commitment to you for 2018. I hope I'm getting the questions in the right order. My prayer is the same for you. You know, ever since Thursday morning, I've been reflecting on the life of Ellen McDonald. She never had an overabundance of this world's resources, but she gave generously anyway. She gave of her time. She gave of her talent to the children in the nursery, to the ministry of stewardship, the Lord knows what all else. And she was so faithful and so big hearted in her, with her financial resources. And I thought about Ellen. I remembered a story you might recall about another lady in another church. Now, unlike Ellen, this woman was wealthy, but like Ellen, she was incredibly generous to various charitable causes around Dallas, Texas, where she lived. And she was particularly gracious with gifts to her church, the First Baptist Church of Dallas. Well, when the Great Depression hit, she lost almost all of her fortune. And to add insult to injury, her health failed, and she wound up in the hospital with some enormous medical bills. Her pastor, J. 
George W. Truett went to visit her and asked, I'm wondering if perhaps you regret all the money that you've given away during your lifetime. And the woman looked at him and said, why, pastor, I'm surprised at you. All I have left is what I've given to Jesus. Where are you going? And what do you want to take with you? When you've shuffled off this mortal coil, all you'll have left is what you've given to Jesus. Amen.